Good morning from the steps of St. George's Anglican Church, Parktown, Johannesburg. Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent. It is also Mothering Sunday. The heading for this morning's sermon might well be, We are transformed by faith. The first reading today, the Old Testament reading, is from the first book of Samuel, chapter 16, verses 1 to 13, in which we heard how David was anointed king of Israel by Samuel. Then we had Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. The New Testament reading is, the, is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 8 to 13, in which Paul describes how we move from darkness into light. And finally, we have our gospel reading, from John chapter 9, verses 1 to 41, in which we have the story of how a blind man received his sight. Today we are indeed presented with some deep challenges in Scripture. At first it all seems rather dense. We are called upon to apply our minds to the following. In the devotions to the, for the fourth Sunday in Lent, Walter Brueggemann, in his A Way Other Than Our Own, Devotions for Lent, which Father Eben very kindly has referred us to and asked us to focus our minds upon during this Lenten season, we are asked to reflect on Jeremiah 30, verses 15 and 16, in which there is a cry over pain. In this morning's collect, we pray that Jesus, the light of the world, will dispel darkness. In the Old Testament reading, David is anointed king of Israel by Samuel. We have Psalm 23, probably one of the most famous and certainly one of the most beautiful poems in the history of literature in the world. The Lord is my shepherd. In the New Testament reading, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we are told that we move from darkness into light. And then, as I've already indicated, in the gospel, a blind man receives his sight from Jesus. At first blush, it might seem rather simple and straightforward. We are told that through faith, light chases away darkness. Certainly, that is true, and that message is there today. But where did the anointing of David, the Lord is my shepherd, and the cry over pain fit in? It is as though we were all presented with one big Lectio Divina, in which the Holy Spirit has presented us with a special message that we shall find only by deep reflection and prayer over its meaning for each one of us, and at this particular point of time in our lives. Let us start bottom up with a gospel reading about Jesus' miraculous restoration of sight. In a moment of exuberance, I enrolled for a preaching course at St. Augustine College here in Johannesburg. It takes place on the third Sunday of every month, and for the February session, we had a talk by Professor Graham Duncan, a Scot and a Presbyterian. And not for nothing has the Scottish preaching tradition a formidable reputation. And he said this, whether you believe the metaphysical stories in the Bible are literally true or metaphorical, their spiritual truth is exactly the same. It is neither a profound nor an original statement. Every properly trained Anglican minister in the worldwide Anglican communion is told this. Indeed, during the Lent and indeed during the retreat, led by Bishop Timothy Baven in the week before my ordination. He said as much, but he added the following important rider. You have no right to disturb the sincerely and deeply held religious convictions of others, taught to the faithful over many generations, by insisting that your view is the only correct one. And listening to Professor Duncan speaking in his broad Scottish accent, I had a God moment a kind of epiphany. It was that in matters of faith, we are often too hard on ourselves and on others. 
We say to ourselves, I can't believe this or that story in the Bible. I'm a failure at faith. It is better that I stay away from church, lest I become more upset and disturbed. Or we say with raised eyebrows, you know that woman, Mrs. Smith, or Mrs. Kumalo, she is a fundamentalist, you know. She believes absolutely in the creation account given in Genesis. Or we say, how can that Mr. Jones or Mr. McQuenna call himself a Christian? He doesn't believe it is true that Jesus walked on water. And these views blind us to a hugely important truth to which we may relate, especially over Lent. The massive, immense, transformative power for the better that comes from faith in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is indeed something to which we can relate, because we see its truth in ourselves, in our everyday lives, our relationships with others, and indeed the whole world itself. And now we can start to make sense of the readings we have today, including the Lenten devotion chosen by Walter Brueggemann. David the shepherd boy, through the process of his anointing, becomes the man born to be king. And without that life story, he could not have written Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, the emphasis on shepherd. He makes me to lie down in pastures green. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Brueggemann, in his Lenten devotion for today, reminds us that pain and hardship and suffering have the potential to be transformative for the good. There is indeed hope. And yes, in these dark days of our coping with the coronavirus, it is important to remember the message that there is indeed hope. Before our Wednesday morning Bible studies were shut down, owing to the coronavirus, we had some excellent sessions. And a few weeks ago, we had a fascinating discussion on justification by faith, predestination, and the elect. I hardly need to say to a congregation like that at St. George's that we Anglicans here are very skeptical of doctrines of predestination and the elect. Indeed, Trevor Huddleston, who had a close relationship with St. George's, wrote in his book, Not for Your Comfort, but John Calvin's interpretations of predestination and the elect helped to give moral justification for apartheid. We certainly do not believe that God decided before each of us was born who would become a Christian, who would be saved, and who would go to heaven. It can be a very cruel set of beliefs, most dangerously inasmuch as it holds forth the idea that the suffering and hardship of individuals was predetermined by God as the wages for some or other sin. Jesus was very much alive to this danger. And the traditional rabbinical view at the time was that suffering occurred because of sin, even the sins of previous generations. But Jesus said of the blind man, neither this man nor his parents sinned. The coronavirus is definitely not as some people seem to believe, God's punishment visits upon us, either as a society or upon us as individuals. So how do we move from darkness into light, as Paul exhorted us in his letter to the Ephesians and as we pray in this morning's collect? We pray, reminding ourselves that Jesus, the light of the world, dispels darkness. And in the letter to the Ephesians, we are told that we move from darkness into light when Jesus, the light of the world, shines upon us. We believe that predestination is not about predetermination, but rather about something akin to privilege. It is indeed a privilege to have the opportunity to be a Christian. But there is nothing inevitable about our salvation. It depends on how we respond to events. David responds to his anointing by believing utterly in his destiny to be king. 
And in the reading this morning, we are told that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, came mightily upon him from that day forward. That is for sure. In Psalm 139, David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And it is no wonder that David looms so large in Old Testament memory. Walter Brueggemann himself wrote a whole book on the phenomenon in David's truth in Israel's imagination and memory. Responsiveness to God is hugely important. We have to do something. And the doing comes not from good works. As Anglicans, we are very Protestant in our belief that we enter the kingdom of God not by doing good works, but through faith. Thereafter, the good works follow. Remember in the gospel reading this morning, the blind man goes and washes in the pool of Siloam. He responds. And what makes him respond as he did? He responds with faith. And he does not intellectualize. He says, in effect, I do not know what Jesus did, but I do know that I was blind and now I can see. I did as he told me. He says, in effect, I responded with faith. Our thoughts today are collected around the movement from darkness into light. In the Pew leaflet, Father Eben reminds us that Lent recalls the times of wilderness and wandering from newly freed Hebrew slaves in exile to Jesus' own temptation in the desert. So how do we get the beautiful life that comes from walking the way of grace? How may the light of Jesus shine upon us? It comes by responding to Jesus with faith. In the office of evening prayer, there is this beautiful, beautiful prayer. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and those things which for our unworthiness we dare not ask and our blindness we cannot ask. Grant us through Jesus Christ our Savior. To move from darkness into light, to have our eyes opened, to walk the way of grace, we must respond to Jesus with faith. But we should not make faith needlessly difficult for ourselves. It may help to remember the three theological sisters, or the three divine sisters, or the three theological virtues, after whom so many beautiful mountains have been named. Faith, hope, and love. These are the spiritual mountaintops. And with love in our hearts, we have the hope that enables us to respond with faith by washing in the pool of Siloam. Jesus said that love of God is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In the famous passage from Paul's first letter to Corinthians, he says that love is the greatest of the three virtues. The three support each other. If one lets love into one's heart, faith and hope tend to follow. At this time of crisis with the coronavirus, we indeed need hope. But through the transformative power of faith in the Holy Spirit, we shall see the right way forward. We shall find solutions and ultimately help to make a better world. We have to respond to God with love in our hearts. After that, all else will follow. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.